Hello everyone and welcome to webinar three, the crucial role of the academic coach in CBE. My name is Carlos Rivers and I'm the operations research analyst for the Institute for Competency-Based Education at a and Commerce. Uh, with me today I have from South Texas College, Kevin Peake and Nancy Gonzalez. Um, we are going to begin the presentation shortly after their brief bio. And uh, please ask questions along the way and the uh, Presenters will answer them after we go through the presentation. Kevin Peake earned his PhD in May of 2000. Throughout the last 20 years, he has worked in both the public and private sector. His employment in the private sector includes founding the Trade Policy Research Group in 2003, with branches located in Valencia, Spain, and San Francisco, California. Documentary and embedded state of work in Mexico City with Peak Media and extensive consulting on international trade policy. His employment in the public sector includes teaching positions at the University of Nevada, like La Universidad Nacional Autónoma de México, Vista College in Berkeley, Northwestern Michigan College, the Victoria College, and South Texas College. He has published articles on issues ranging all the way from trade policy to regional trade integration and has received awards for his work in documentary filmmaking. Some of his most recent projects include collaboration on the award-winning documentary film on the North American Free Trade Agreement, Trading Freedoms, investigative work in Venezuela on the economic impact of former President Chavez and his administration, and various articles published in Mexico on regional trade integration and the rise of self-defense entities. Dr. Peake is currently the program director for the bachelor's program at South Texas College. Nancy Gonzalez uh, began her post-secondary education at South Texas College in 1999. She graduated with her associate's degree in 2001 and continued working in higher education at South Texas Vocational Technical Institute in McAllen, Texas. As a business computer instructor and faculty coordinator. In 2009, she graduated with a bachelor's in technology management from South Texas College while working for the institution as the student success specialist in the math and science division. A year later, she earned a master's in business administration with a focus in technology management from the University of Phoenix and has been accepted into the educational leadership doctoral program at Lamar University. She continues at South Texas College as the academic coach for the new competency-based program Bachelors of Applied Science in Organizational Leadership. Guys, thank you for uh, being here and giving this presentation. I'm going to give it up to you now. Hello, my name is Dr. Kevin Peake. I'm the former chair of the bachelor's program in organizational leadership at South Texas College. I'm currently the program coordinator for the four bachelor's programs that we offer here. Um, Nancy Gonzalez will be my co-presenter. She is the academic coach for the program. She'll be in momentarily. As a matter of fact, her temporary absence is a testimony to how important her role is. She's meeting with a student, if you can imagine, that's her dedication. I also have with us um, the most recent addition to our team, Dr. Emma Miller. Dr. Emma Miller comes to us with excellent academic credentials, a formidable professional experience, tremendously qualified. She's the new chair of our bachelor's program in organizational leadership. Emma, would you like to say, say a few words? Hello, this is Dr. Miller, and I'm just very excited to, to be a part of the BASEL program and to uh, be able to collaborate with all of you as we move forward with our respective, uh, respective programs. Wonderful. Um, Carlos, thank you for giving us the opportunity to host this forum, and to all of those of you who have taken the time to be with us, we genuinely appreciate the, the interest in our program, and we hope that this is a rewarding and informative experience. So what we're going to be talking about essentially is the role of the academic coach. And I think invariably, when we mention that topic, the first question that comes to mind is, why an academic coach? Why is it that we would want to incorporate an academic coach into our program? After all, we have four bachelor's programs. We're working on a fifth. The first three programs that we had didn't require and it hadn't occurred to us to include an academic coach. Well, when we were developing the fourth bachelor's program, we look back at the successes and some of the failures of our previous bachelor's programs and we asked ourselves a fundamental question. What could we do to make this program more successful? What could we do to maximize our students' success, which is the core mission of this institution? What could we do to preempt some of the problems that, that we had encountered, and I'm not going to pre pre pretend that we didn't, 
some of the problems that we had encountered with the other bachelor's programs. So while we were developing the bachelor's program in organizational leadership, we looked into different components that we could incorporate into that program, as I mentioned, really to optimize our chances of being successful. And what we discovered was that the academic coach in virtually all the different studies that we came across, all the different programs that we saw, we discovered that the academic coach is a, fu fu is a fundamental mechanism for achieving success in any program. Um, so why the academic coach? Well, first, increased graduation and retention rates. Um, based on our evaluation of 17 different studies, we found that retention and completion rates are greater in coach groups. This holds true for every length of time following enrollment. After six months, students in the coach groups are 5.2 percentage points more likely to still be enrolled than students in the non-coach groups. At the end of 12 months, this effect is 5.3 percentage points. This effect persists for at least one year more, for at least one more year after the coaching has concluded. After 18 months, there's a 4.3 percentage point increase in college retention. And after 24 months, there is still a 3.4 percentage point treatment effect from the coaching. These differences are all statistically significant over a 99% confidence interval. Moreover, these results do not change when we control for age, gender, ACT scores, high school GPA, SAT scores, on or off campus residence, receipt of merit scholarship, Pell Grant awards, et cetera, et cetera. So what we discovered is that we have increased graduation rates, we have increased retention rates, as a result of employing the academic coach model. Um, and something that I had neglected to mention, but please, what we would like is for this to be more of a conversation, a dialogue, than a simple presentation. So as we're going through this information, if you have any questions at all, please don't hesitate to, to ask. Anything that you feel merits further elaboration or, or clarification, um, we'd be more than happy to respond. In fact, we'd encourage you to do so. It's my conviction that that's really the best way for us to maximize our understanding here. If there's anything that you're unsure about, ask a question and that will lead to other questions. And hopefully that'll give us a broader pre um, panorama of what the academic coach's role is and how the academic coach can contribute to a program. So increased graduation and retention rates, the first reason why we opted for the academic coach model. The second, improved academic performance. What we found is that when you have an academic coach who's not only following the students, but is engaging in extensive case management, the academic performance is heightened. Um, let me ask those of you who are here, because I would like to get your input on this also, um, why is it you think that the presence of an academic coach would contribute to academic performance? Any responses? Any opinions as to why you think an academic coach would contribute to academic performance? Okay. Well, in our particular circumstances, the role of the academic coach is to monitor the students and to engage in extensive case study. So when we find that a student might be in a particular situation where they're encountering difficulties in the class, the academic coach, because that individual contacts the students once every two weeks, is in a position to be able to intervene. Look, we've got, Carlos, we've got a little bit of interference. Can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you just fine. And, and Kevin, uh, I just wanted to add that you did have some answers. Uh, Kim mentions accountability. Sandra mentions accountability as well. And Lita said, higher education is confusing to students. Coaches help provide information and keep them on track. Carlos, we can, we can barely hear you. You know what? Let, let me just adjust something here on the phone. There's a small problem. Okay. Kevin, do we have you back? 
I apologize, everyone. It seems our friends from South Texas College are having uh, some technical difficulties. I'm sure they'll be right back on. Kevin, how are you guys doing over there? Can you send me a uh, chat to make sure that you guys are getting closer to fixing the issue? and keep up with the status of those students that are possibly at risk. So we have our faculty communicate with the academic coaches and identifying all those students early on as they move through the seven weeks to figure out which ones are at risk. So that helps us to be able to move forward and identify them. And so Nancy, who's our academic coach, speaks on one on one to one basis with these students and becomes extremely valuable in finding out why they're not uh, successful in their in their uh, in their programs right now. The third reason why we selected we selected the academic coach model. Let's see, I Carlos, and now the third one's not appearing. We're just having all kinds of technical problems. I apologize to you, and I apologize to everybody for that. But I think we've got them taken under we got them under control. We just had a tech adjusting the sound and some other things, so we should be okay. Um, just as a confirmation, Carlos, can you hear us and can you clearly see the screen? Yes. Yes, okay. to all of above. I will add that uh, so when you ask your question, uh, some of the audience answered accountability, and then uh, higher education is confusing to students. Coaches help provide information and keep them on track. Yes, absolutely, and that is a very, very good response. And what we find in I would say about 30% of the situations where students are encountering difficulties, particularly at the inception of a program, is there's some slight confusion. And if we don't address that confusion early enough, it can snowball and it can be a significant obstacle to their success. The value of the academic coach, let's look at this in two contexts, at least here. The academic coach will in the beginning meet individually with each one of our students, address any questions that those students have, and provide them with insights into our program and how the program functions. So there we can address any confusion that they might have at the beginning. But we all know how students are. Sometimes we can tell them three or four or five or six or seven times and it might not sink in. And on top of that, there are other issues that might arise. But because our academic coach, and this is modeled on how academic coaches are structured throughout the country, our academic coach meets periodically with students, specifically once every two weeks. And she's very proactive. She will ask those students, do you have any questions about the program? Do you have any questions about the institution? There's anything that we can clarify for you. So most definitely that comment is 100% is on the bullseye. One of the difficulties that we encounter with, with student success really has to do with misunderstanding, misconception. And if we can get to them early enough, the, ev the empirical evidence, our experience here, as well as all the literature confirms that we can minimize that confusion, we can maximize their success, which takes us to the second point, which is shorter time to completion. When we can dispel uh, confusion, when we can clarify any questions that they have, when we can to a certain extent, we're not babysitting them, we're guiding them, we're helping them. When we can guide them and help them through the process, what we've discovered is that all of those factors, as well as some others, they combine for this wonderful synergy to really reduce the time to completion. Um, our program has been in effect for three and a half years. And in that time period, we've had 305 students graduate. Um, we maintain a high level, well, by May we'll have 305 students graduate. I need to qualify that. 
Uh, we have some very high level of quality control mechanisms to make sure that we're not a diploma mill. So these students have been able to move through this program very quickly. Imagine, if you will, a bachelor's degree that's been created. And in the space of three and a half years, we have 305 students who will be graduating from that program. Um, it has to do with a lot of different factors, but mostly it has to do with the intervention, the participation of the academic coach, and the guidance that the academic coach provides. To give you a specific statistic, of our students, <clears throat> and this, this is probably going to change with time, but at this point it's almost unbelievable. Of all of our students who have graduated, 100% have graduated in two years. I almost don't believe that statistic myself. I almost don't believe the 305 statistic in three years. But that is the case, and once again, um, the evidence points very clearly to the, to the role of the academic coach. Um, accelerated student adaptation and engagement, and this goes back to what we were mentioning a little bit earlier. <coughs> if, if we can provide students with the information that they need in the beginning, and we can continually meet with them to address all of their needs, the students are going to adapt more quickly to the educational environment. They're going to be more engaged. They're going to have a sense of buy-in. And the final analysis, maybe that's the most important factor contributing towards student success. If students believe that they have a home here, if they believe that they're a part of the program, and they understand how it works, they're invariably going to be much more, much more successful. So with the academic coach, we're able to move them along much more quickly, and we're able to help them to become more engaged and more participatory. Um, you know, I always have a tendency of speaking too quickly, and I'm speaking even more quickly now because I don't want to monopolize all the time that, that by all rights, should be allocated to our academic coach. But if with this, this excessive rapidity I'm not communicating something clearly, please feel free to interrupt me. And as I mentioned earlier, if you have any questions about anything as we proceed, don't hesitate to ask. Okay, intervention to preempt new and resolve existing problems. And to a certain degree, that's what we had mentioned a little bit earlier. Um, so does anybody have any questions about these, these main reasons why, in the beginning, we decided to opt for the academic coach model? to other reasons why it might be useful to have an academic coach model. Okay, I'm going to turn the floor over to our academic coach, Nancy Gonzalez, and she'll proceed with the next screen. Thank you for your attention and participation. Hi, good afternoon. This is Nancy Gonzalez, academic coach for the Bachelor of Applied Science and Organizational Leadership Program. We thank you again for uh, participating in this webinar this afternoon. Um, basically, I think Dr. Peek has gone over a lot of the information that I do um, perform at my job. Um, this, what you see on your screens right now, is, is basically my main priority, which is case management. Um, I will be co co covering each one of these bullet points um, in, in a different slide, so if you would just please follow along with me. Um, this is a snapshot of what I work with every student. Um, every student that comes to my office, I do request that they go through an admission checklist. Of one of them is the general admission application. There is no department application for a student. Um, I do have them submit their transcripts for evaluation, and once these are um, evaluated, this is what populates for, for me. This is what we call degree works and a degree audit. Um, as you can see here, um, this student already has some, some work. It's already at 79% progress completion. Um, the student is still missing two of the Spanish courses and relatively um, 
24 credit hours more to be completed. Um, you can see that there are 16 credits applied. Here we need a total of 48 credits. So this is how, how I basically evaluate each student. All this information needs to be completed before I am able to advise. Uh, once a student is ready for registration, we you, we, I do use the, the banner system to enroll. This is a screen where I enroll students. The advantage of registration is that it is exclusive to my, um, to my registration, basically. A student cannot go to a general admissions and be enrolled. However, a student can declare uh, organizational leadership as their major um, when they are applying for admission. Um, it is, we do have two, two, two um, requirements, I'm sorry, in our program. One of them is TFI compliance, which is basically the placement exam a student has to take in order for them to uh, take college ready courses. And the other will be uh, 2.5 GPA. Uh, we do have students coming in with uh, transfer credits. So if a student has uh, zero institutional credits here at Saptic College, then um, a zero GPA could still be a valid GPA and we can still proceed with uh, enrollment. Once a student has been um, enrolled in our program and they need any schedule changes of any kind, they do have to provide this form to me. And again, because I am, I am the case, their case manager, um, I am the only person that can make any schedule changes at drop. Um, I am basically their one point of contact for everything that, 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 that they need. Um, then after that, we do have a mandatory orientation. And here, um, Dr. Peek and I get together and basically um, provide a, a general information about the competency-based courses in our upper level. And I'll go ahead and, and allow him to elaborate a little more on this. As we mentioned earlier, if we want our students to be successful in this program, then we need to provide them with tools most important tool that anybody can have, and particularly a, a student who's beginning a new, innovative, novel, different program, is, a sort of, is student orientation. They need to know how that program is going to be structured and how it functions. So at the beginning of every seven-week session, and our, our sessions are seven weeks long, we have a student orientation, and there's a number of steps that we adhere to fairly closely. At the beginning of each student orientation, we provide background information about the program and its evolution. Um, our program is fairly interesting. It was established based on a grant that was provided to us in 2014. The purpose of that grant was to, was to provide $1 million to institutions of higher education in the state of Texas that were able to create a bachelor's degree that was accredited, that was at an acceptable qualitative level, and that cost less than $15,000. So we applied for this grant, Texas A&M Commerce applied for this grant, literally countless institutions all throughout the state applied for this grant. Um, many of those institutions were even skeptical as they were applying. I mean, the very notion that you could provide a bachelor's degree for less than $15,000 um, seems, seems heterodoxical. It goes against conventional wisdom. And as that was the case, only two institutions qualified for this, for this grant. South Texas College, Texas A&M Commerce. So we kind of give them, give the students a little bit of history about the grant, how the program has evolved, um, and where we are right now. Next, we involve the students in the presentation through a stimulating dialogue. Um, as we mentioned earlier, I believe that with presentations, probably the best approach is to have a conversation, talk to people. That way we can share ideas, we can get one another's input, and in the process we can answer any questions that come along. And one of the questions that invariably comes from our students, and then I try to touch upon this also at this stage, is, well, you're a community college, you're offering a bachelor's degree, is that bachelor's degree really going to be taken seriously? What happens when I graduate? What happens when I go out of the private sector, the public sector? Will they accept that degree? What happens when I'm thinking about applying for graduate programs? Will the degree be accepted? So invariably this question comes out during the student or during the, the dialogue, if it doesn't, then I find a way to introduce it. Because if they haven't mentioned it, it doesn't mean that five or six or 10 or 20 or 30 of them aren't thinking it, and, and generally they are. And our response is always very favorable. Um, based on almost all the mechanisms that we use to measure the success, the acceptability of this program, it's doing very well. Um, our students, and by the way, 20% of our students who have graduated from this program have gone on to master's programs. So 20% of our students who go on to master's programs 
are generally as competitive or more competitive and more successful than their counterparts who had gone through the traditional route. What we've also found in terms of job placement is that once our students are either are either able to obtain employment or they're, they receive an, an ascension where they currently are employed, they're very successful. So we feel good about the program. We can effectively communicate to the program that it's an accepted program, it's taken seriously. Um, we mentioned that it is accredited by the Southern, Southern Association of Colleges and Universities. And then, of course, we go on to show them some of the results that come from our CAP exam. The CAP exam is an exam that we administer, administer to students when they begin the program and then again when they finish it. And the difference between the results should show the value added of the program. And generally, those results are very favorable. So after we provide some background information about the program and its evolution, and we try to involve the students in, in dialogue, we then discuss the value of our program. And I think this is important and something that we want to definitely make sure that students walk away with, is that we now find ourselves in a, in a world where and it almost seems as though this happened overnight. It's absolutely indispensable that you have a bachelor's degree if you want to move ahead. There are very few positions anymore that people aspire to that don't require a bachelor's degree. So it's, it's kind of cheerleading, it's kind of a pep talk, but you know, we have our students' best interest at heart, and so this is a, an opportunity also to motivate them to stay in the program. Next, review the competency-based model, and in particular, how to navigate through it. Um, are any of you coming? Are any of you coming to us with a fully developed competency-based model? Are most of you in the process of developing a competency-based program? Well, as you already know, if you've developed a program or in the process of developing one, competency-based programs can make, take many different forms. Our competency-based program is, for the most part, a standard pre-test, post-test model that, as I mentioned, we developed in collaboration with Texas A&M Commerce. Um, because we've been working, with it, working through it for so long, it's second nature to us, and we sometimes forget. Kevin, sorry, sorry to, to cut you off. Uh, yeah, I, I, I'm getting some answers. Developing and piloting uh, Sandra says, R is fully developed. Lita, we have, a, we have seven degree certificates that are CBE. And Nadia, yes, we have a CBE program. So we have a good mix of people that do have uh, programs developed or are, are moving along that route. Sorry, go ahead. Okay, okay and... Um, and remember, they, everyone's uh, is muted, right? So uh, we're getting the, the questions and answers in um, at this point. So I would have to read them out loud to you. Okay. Um, well, I, I would ask, I'm ask my colleagues because I'd also like to benefit from your experience. Um, what kinds of obstacles or challenges do you face in helping students to understand this competency-based model? And if you have an academic coach, how does the academic coach facilitate that process? Kevin, I had a question, a previous question while everyone's writing down their answers from Sharon. She asked, how many students do you have in your program that you are actively working with? And see, this is an interesting, this interesting situation that we find ourselves in right now. We have approximately 450 students who are in the program, registered in the program. Um, as I mentioned, by May we'll have 305 students who have graduated. Uh, the number of students who are taking courses at this moment, Nancy, how many would that be? 400 students are actually taking courses, and it's raised a big challenge. When we first developed the program in the planning stage, our objective was to have a ratio of 80 students to one academic coach. Um, the program has grown much more than even the most optimistic of projections had anticipated, and so we're in the process of hiring another academic coach. Um, for us, I think what our experience has taught us is probably a ratio of 105, 110 to one academic coach would be best. Right now our academic coach is, I can, I can be honest, she's just overwhelmed. Um, the success of this program is largely a testimony to how she's been able to handle um, the growing student demand. But it's, it's just getting to be too much at this point, which is fortunately we are in the process of hiring on, bringing on an additional academic coach. 
Kevin Nadia asks, what is the faculty role in your CBE program? How do they work alongside with your academic success coach? Great question. Okay, I think it's a fantastic coach. Nancy, would you like to respond to that? Sure. Well, I think in, in a couple of slides further, I'm going to, to elaborate a little more on this, but um, I, I am the liaison between basically the program chair, the administra administrators, and the, the faculty and students. So many of, of the faculty uh, do email me from, from time to time as I do send, send out reminders uh, the first week to see if students are, are active in their, in their courses. Um, towards the end, maybe the, the fifth week out of the seven week, to see how students are doing, to see if, if there's any students that are not passing at that point, and maybe I should contact them. Um, I do follow up with students at least four or five times throughout the seven week session for those that are at risk for not passing or have not um, participated or been active in the classes. Um, faculty also engage with me when, when they have um, to submit any changes of grades or submit course syllabi. There are, again, other slides that I'll be covering as, as we move along. Thank you, Nancy. In many, ways, in many ways, what we had intended in the beginning, and it's very similar to what Western Governors and some of the other more well-known institutions in the area of competency-based education had pioneered we visualize the instructor as being somewhat of a facilitator, um, an expert in the material in question, but that most of the real intervention would be in the hands of our academic coach. And what we found is that in the beginning, there was a certain bit of resistance, um, and that's to be expected. We were going against a model and a behavioral pattern that our professoriate was, was accustomed to, and so they resisted. But as the program has developed, and they've had an opportunity to see the benefits that are a direct and indirect result of an engaged, knowledgeable academic coach, most of them have come on board. And those who haven't come on board, um, the arguments are, are not as valid as, as I would like. So we're, we, we're optimistic that it will continue to move in this direction, but I cannot emphasize enough how the role of the academic coach has really been the determining factor. There's a lot of factors that come together, but this is really the determining factor, the most important element in the success of the program. Was there another question, Carlos? Uh, no, that was the last one. Wow, and thank you so much for these questions. I, I think the questions are productive. They're productive because they get all of us thinking about different issues that maybe we're not including in our presentation that we hadn't, hadn't anticipated either. And also, from a purely selfish perspective, I'm learning from, from your input. And these are ideas that we can also incorporate into our program. So with student orientation, we begin by reviewing the competency-based model, and in particular, how to navigate through these courses. Um, following that, we review the overall role of the academic coach, and we've had a chance to talk about that, but it's important that our, under our students understand who the academic coach is, what that individual's role is, and most importantly, that if they have any concerns, if they have any questions, um, any issues with their courses, they shouldn't be shy, they shouldn't hesitate to contact the academic coach. Um, what's a little interesting about this is that most students are, are happy to hear that, they, they embrace this model, but we've actually had a couple of students who feel that it's intrusive. And so we're always, in the beginning of the program, we're always sure during, during the orientation as well as when we're registering students, we're sure that they understand that our academic coach is periodically going to be contacting them. Um, as I mentioned in the beginning, we had some students who felt that it was an intrusion, but as time has gone by, they've seen the, the benefits of that. And as I mentioned, we place emphasis on this point in the beginning. We are going to have an academic coach who is going to be following your progress. Um, we're doing this because we want to ensure that you're successful. We then answer student questions and we provide any follow-up information, which is basically our, our student orientation. Um, we're hoping to have it 100% online soon for those students who don't want to have to listen to me and uh, talk for an hour. Let me move the, pass the floor on to Nancy Gonzalez once again. This is basically just what um, a competency course looks like, and Dr. Peek actually goes over this with the students. We project this for them on the orientation and um, let them know where to find their grades, how to access the pre, the post exam. Um, this is my class. Uh, I also teach for the program. I teach the business principles class, and this is another aspect of the academic coach. That she's able not only to to be the, the, the actual um, advisor for the program, but it's also part of the, part of the teaching um, involved. And believe it or not, students do like this idea. So um, the next topic, topic here is also um, 
related to how, how the academic coach assists the program chair. So it's not just about the student uh, needs, it's also about the chair, what the chair needs. And this is not, if, if, I, if there's something I, I should say about the academic coach position is that you shouldn't find a person that, that is sufficient and that, that um, is able to, that has credentials and able to, to stay um, uh, eight hours a day. You need to find someone with a passion, someone that wants to help students. You'll find me working from home at 10, 11, 12 at night. I have some students tell me, hey, Nancy, do you ever take a break? Um, I am here on the weekends. I am here um, during our holidays. So you need to find someone that really, really wants to assist not just uh, our student population, but also has a passion for, for, the, for the job, for what they do. So um, these are some additional duties that I have that, that I do uh, help with, with the program chair, which is uh, assist with the curriculum revision process. So as you know, revisions are made, uh, in our case, every fall semester take into effect. So right now, as a matter of fact, we are working through, through the revision process of STEM. And I do have to communicate with the curriculum and accreditation office, office from time to time. Um, we do facilitate the faculty student orientation, which we just went over. Uh, we participate in policy and program updates. So when we say that, we meet with faculty and we uh, get their input and see what other areas we can improve to help student success. In addition, um, I assist with the course development of schedules. So we do have six, seven week sessions year round. So there is a lot of schedules being populated every seven week session. So I did get together with the program chair and began assigning faculty to te teach these courses. Um, I also assist with the coordination of the advisory committee meetings. We do, so far we've had only one meeting. We just put together an advisory committee last, uh, last semester. So currently we're working and in, in getting together again in, in the next month or so to discuss again um, what, what they have to say. We also listen to, to, to their feedback and come back and, and, and learn um, how well we can, we can help our alumni. Um, I assist with the, with the contract. Um, faculty need to get paid, so I do assist with the, with the preparation of the notice of employment. Um, from time to time, I do review faculty transcripts and um, basically it's just a preliminary um, revision because ultimately HR is the one that clears them. Um, further on, I help with the conference proposals. As a matter of fact, we have one coming up soon, so I do help the chair in writing these proposals and um, going out there um, to promote their program and also to discuss our, our challenges and, and not only just share our, our achievements but also discuss what challenges we have and see what we can learn from other institutions. Um, I provide um, different types of, of, of reports, financial and performance reports to, to different other entities. Um, our board of trustees, or the Texas Higher Coordinating Board, uh, Pearson, since we also have a contract with Pearson, we also have to provide that. And um, of course, collaborate with other other stakeholders to, to help the recruitment and improvement of our program. Um, and these are some other reporting that I have to to, to populate for for the chair, which will be the the graduate report. Uh, as, as you know, we we're, our sessions are every seven weeks, so I'm constantly running reports to to inform the chair where we're at, how many uh, current current students we have in our program, um, the different types of students that we have, traditional. Um, non-traditional, online, and then as I mentioned, the, the Pearson reporting. Um, this basically concludes our presentation at our end. Um, do you guys have any questions for us? Thank you, Kevin and Nancy, for that wonderful presentation. Uh, we will now open the floor to questions.
Okay, from Nadia, what type of questions do you receive from your students? Do you make scheduled phone calls? Yes, I do have students um, that have a full-time job and they need to uh, schedule evening appointments. Um, so I get that I get that type of question and the questions about advisement. Every seven weeks, they have to um, request advisement. I, they don't automatically just enroll, and because they cannot enroll on their own, they do have to send me emails. I have students telling me. Um, when they have been in communication with their professor and then they're getting a response, we normally tell them that um, faculty will have a 48-hour turnaround period to respond to their to, the, to their uh, inquiries. But sometimes faculty um, don't don't get back within that 48 period time. So they, that's when I get questions about, hey Nancy, can you help out? I have uh, I've sent an instructor uh, a question and I have not gotten a response, or I've taken a pretest and have not gotten a response or feedback or a grade. Um, I get questions about graduation. Some students that are finishing the program, they want to be proactive and get their ducks in line, so they want to know a projected time of graduation, or as they're graduating, they, they want to know um, more information about gra graduation and how to go about it. Um, if they're trying to get a hold of an instructor and they don't have their, their information, again, basically anything, financial aid is another big one, financial aid and um, uh, payment options. Um, so I'm basically that person they contact to answer all of those questions. Thank you, Nancy. Uh, uh, from Marlon, uh, Kevin, I think this was more for you, but uh, <laughs> how are academic career coaches funded? Yeah, What's the, how did you get the line item? Where is it coming from? Oh, oh, the academic career, oh, okay. Sorry how are that. academic career coaches funded? When we, when we solicited the original TAB grant, and it was a tab, it was a grant for one million dollars. There were funds that were originally set aside in that grant for seed money for the academic coach, and that's how we finance the academic coach's role for the first two years. As those funds have been exhausted, the institution has taken on the responsibility of defraying those expenses. However, what we found, fortunately, is that given the unique configuration of this program, the revenues that we're generating exceed our costs. So even though the funds might come from another source within the institution, we're still returning to the institution uh, more than we're incurring. So indirectly, I guess you could say that this program is paying for itself and is paying for the academic coach. Um, I mentioned earlier that we had recently solicited um, another grant um, under the same organization, the same TAB organization. We received that grant and funds have been aside within that grant to finance another academic coach. But generally, with most of the grants that we've seen and in accordance with our methodology, we establish the position, and then as the program begins to grow and it becomes self-sustaining, we're able to generate enough revenue to maintain the, ac the academic coach indefinitely. Excellent. Thank you, Kevin. Um, Nancy, this one's more for you. <laughs> uh, from okay. Sandra, so you're actively managing 400 students every seven weeks? That's correct. Yes, and sometimes even more. I mean, it just depends. In the summer, in summer we don't have a high number of students enrolling because of financial aid. But fall, especially fall, fall just explodes on us every time. This year, we, had, we were surprised because spring was also a, a large number of students. I think. Compared to last spring, last spring we, we had 300 students. This spring we have 450. So, yes. And just to Nancy, have, you that, have you seen that some students need, might need more help than others? I think that's what Sandra's getting to, um, you know, at the, the, oh, absolutely. At the, actively, yeah. Absolutely, yes. I mean, it, it doesn't mean that I am, I am reaching out to all 400 students at once. Um, definitely, I do, I do case manage mostly those that um, need more assistance. I do attend to everyone's inquiries and everyone's concerns, but ultimately I do follow up with those that I do see need more assistance. For example, those that have taken a competency course before and, and failed it, or those that have a large number of incompletes, those are the ones I, I am more, more um, constantly contacting. Yeah, and you know, Carlos, just to follow up on what she was saying, but also to reiterate a point that we made earlier, although we do find ourselves in this laborious position of a ratio of 400 plus students to one academic coach, we certainly don't recommend it. And it's the impetus for our recent decision to hire an additional academic coach. Um, to a certain degree, sometimes, most recently, as the program has exploded, 
we find ourselves in, in triage mode. We identify the students who have the, the greatest priorities, the greatest needs, and that's where we place our emphasis. But at the same time, we are sure to contact all of those students. And this is why Nancy had mentioned earlier, for those of you who are in the process of considering hiring an academic coach, obviously there are a number of employment criteria that you're going to be considering. But the one which is not necessarily measurable or tangible, and you really can only see it when you're talking to somebody to get a feel for them, they need to be passionate about what they're doing. They need to be passionate about what they're doing. They need to believe in the mission of the institution. And they have to really care about the students, because otherwise it's absolutely impossible that somebody's going to be able to manage 400 students, much less even manage 80 students. So most definitely, the role, the role of the academic coach is indispensable. Find somebody with passion. Find somebody who, who's willing to give it 100%. But you know, don't find yourself in a situation where we are right now with 400. It, it's good and it's bad. I mean, we're glad that, and I'm sure, Carlos, you can identify with this, because I'm thinking the same thing has happened at um, Texas A&M. Uh, how many academic coaches do you have at this point? Uh, we have one, uh, but the program also has uh, faculty that uh, take on that uh, that role as well that are in the department and they help with, with uh, business processes and uh, administrative duties so so business and administrative but are they interacting directly with the students yes 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 uh, directly with the student yeah are those yeah so for example if an instructor is teaching let's say government would that instructor be an academic coach for a student who's in that class or do you no, no 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 this is part of their office so we have two faculty members in the office that also assist students like the success coach with registrations, but it's not part of the course. Okay. So uh, from Nadia, um, do you use systems to manage your caseload? Great question. No. No. No, okay. I do not. Okay. Uh, from Kim, what seems to be a common thread of students that are having challenges with the CBE format, if any? Do you mind if I just and I'll hand it over to you? I believe it or not, the biggest problem that we found is logistic. It's logistic. The manner in which our program was designed is that the competency-based courses, or at least our lower level competency-based courses where students have the most difficulties, they're online courses, and each one of those courses is divided up into multiple shells, each shell corresponding to a different competency. Students aren't accustomed to that format, and they often become confused. Specifically, if you have a student who's accustomed to taking online courses, you open up that online course, there's one shell. You take your exams, you read the materials. Once you've finished everything in that shell, it's over. In our competency-based courses, each class has a number of different shells. Once again, each one corresponding to a different competency. So sometimes we have students who will finish up one shell and they think that the class is over. During the orientation, we address that issue and some of the other logistical issues to ensure that just mechanically students need to understand how to navigate through the course. Obviously, there are some other barriers that come along that Nancy can, can discuss, but what we've both seen is that in the majority of the cases, that's really one of the biggest ones. Great, thank you. Um, from Lida, uh, what is passing for your CBE courses? Uh, and she mentions that uh, theirs is 80% or they have to repeat the competency. So what's passing rate at your institution? The same, 80%. 80% and above, okay. Uh, from Nadia, also, how do you admit students for each seven-week cohort? Do you work with each cohort admitted and continuing students each seven weeks? We do not have cohorts. We just uh, open it up for enrollment every seven-week session, and uh, as long as they meet the criteria for, for admission, which is a 2.5 GPA and TSI compliance, uh, we can work with the credits that they have, or if they have zero credits, then at that point I just provide general advisement. Excellent. Uh, Nadia, do you mind if I ask you a question? She says yes. <laughs> I, I, now, I think she was the individual who just made the reference to the 80% that's necessary to pass a, a course. No, that's um, Lita. Uh, that was Lita. Oh, okay. So this would be directed towards Lita. My, my apologies. Um, in our program, in order to pass the competency, we require that students have passed each competency or each exam with an 80%. If they don't, they're required to take, retake the course, but the grade that they receive in the course is predicated upon the average of all of those post-tests. 
Is that the same approach that they use to calculate in the final grade? Yes, it is the same approach from Lida. Okay. Thank you. And what institution does she represent? Lord Fairfax Community College in Virginia. Okay. Thank you very much, ma'am. Okay, Kevin and Nancy, I think that was uh, the last question you guys had. I just wanted uh, to thank you once again for taking time out of your busy schedule for being uh, here with us. And I would like to thank all the participants also for uh, being here with us uh, for their presentation. Kevin, uh, Nancy, anything else you guys would like to add? No, I'd just like to apologize for the technical problems that we had in the beginning. We've um, been undergoing some, some changes here at the college. All right, everyone, uh, webinar four uh, will be coming up uh, next month, and I will send uh, invitations out for that uh, in the coming week. Thank you again, everyone, for attending. Uh, you guys have a re uh, great rest of the day. Thank you, Kevin and Nancy. Thank you, Carlos. Bye.